Now, can you tell me your story about going to prison? Yeah, it's it's interesting. Is it a story that you want to share? Or yeah, very happy to. Uh, um, uh, oddly enough, um, it was one of the most special experiences of my life. Uh, it didn't feel like that at the time, <laughs> though. It, became something very special, not because of what it was to other people, but what it was in terms of the internal experience. So uh, it was an ordinary day in the life of a Greenpeace boat. Uh, We were in the Baltic Sea and there was um, a, 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 a law where if you dumped oil into the Baltic Sea, you got a fine. Uh, and uh, uh, but if you had an accident and spilt oil, there was no fine. Uh, it's a bit like if you run into a car, you know, no problems if you didn't mean to do it, um, you know. So um, uh, ships, in terms of getting rid of their uh, old engine oil and so forth, would just go out into the middle of the sea um, and dump it and then say, sorry, we had a spill, it wasn't our fault. Uh, we didn't mean to do it. And this happened repeatedly. And there was one ship called the Fargovic. And the Fargovic had done this repeatedly. And there was a, a court case where we almost nailed the Fargovic, or Greenpeace almost nailed the, nailed the Fargovic. But it got it got out um, by some court ruling. Okay, so it was, it was in our sights. And um, uh, so we... Uh, find it out at sea, um, we take up the little zodiacs and some of the rock climbers uh, put up their ropes onto the deck and they climb up. And in Greenpeace style, which I so respect, I have so much respect for that organisation, um, you know, there's no violence, there's no aggression. We simply have a letter that we wish to take to the captain. And, uh, and the letter is asking for a response and we will stay on board. Well, I wasn't on board at that point. The, the rock climbers, the climbers up said, and we will stay on board until we have a response from you. And, it, and it's basically challenging what actually did happen when you dumped that oil on the, whatever, the 13th of March or whatever it was. And, of course, no response comes. The captain doesn't quite know how to respond to this letter and no response comes. So they say, well, we're, we're, we're happy to stay till the response comes. And so we pull into port and we follow the ship in. And, of course, as as happens, uh, nothing can actually happen. There's no unloading and uh, or offloading allowed um, while there are uh, unauthorised people on board. So we basically shut the ship down and and we chain ourselves to the boat. So we do this in rosters and at one point someone came and said, yeah, people are tired, we need to have new people. So on I went and chained myself to the, the boat, which is what you do. <laughs> Uh, until we get a response from the, the ship company. And, um, and at some point the police have come along and sawn through the chain and, and uh, put us into prison. Um, what was unfortunate was that the, the Jötiburg, um shootings were the year before and we were in a small provincial town and they immediately labelled us as terrorists. So on board Greenpeace, um, we get a briefing by the lawyer and the lawyer said um, maximum crime would be uh, break and entry um, um, and uh, that'll be six months in prison. And I thought to myself, I can do six months in prison. You know, that's fine. I can do that. <laughs> um, and, um, and again, why, you might ask? Because I love this place. Yeah. So, yes, I could do six months in prison. (laughs) Um, uh, However, when they get into the cells, something I'm aware of, something's not quite right. I'm supposed to have access to my Greenpeace lawyer beautiful Jan, who I'm still in contact with in, in, uh, um, in Sweden, and his wonderful wife, who was also incredibly supportive, his wife at the time, who was incredibly supportive. Um, and, uh, but I wasn't allowed to ring. I thought, oh, that's funny. I was told I'd be allowed to ring my lawyer. Um, 
uh, I was then I was told I'd be held indefinitely. I could be held indefinitely without a trial. So we have the same terrorist legislation here in Australia. If you if I think someone's a terrorist, I they can be held indefinitely without trial. So I thought, you know, something's not going quite right here. <laughs> and I, my anxiety rose. Um, we were in a, a cell the size of a small bathroom. Um, uh, it had a mattress on the floor and there was some feces and blood still around in the cell. And being a doctor, I was aware of HIV and hep C being in this um this population of people who inhabit these places. So I asked if I could clean it up, and, of course, I wasn't allowed to. And, you know, um, no one, when I called, no one came to the cell. Um, I was cold. Uh, everything's taken off you. I was cold. I couldn't have a blanket. Um, you know, there was a level of, it was just Sweden, it wasn't terrible, but there was a level of hardship that was being obviously consciously directed towards us. And this went on for several days. And um, then one day a jailer came up to me and he said, you're from Greenpeace, aren't you? And I said, yes. And he said, I love what you do. Every day they keep you in. I will give another $20 to Greenpeace. I went, wow, this is working. <laughs> It started to change after that. Um, we had a preliminary trial that was picked up by the police car taken to the court. Um, uh, the police turned around and said to me as I got out of the car, good, good luck, I hope you win. Um, I could start to feel the support. Um, I had an interpreter uh, in, I had my speech prepared because I knew this was where I could talk you know I didn't get much opportunity to have the microphone but court was where I'd get the microphone um, and um, uh, and my interpreter as I stood up and gave my speech in English was gripping my hand and then she gave it in Swedish uh, with full emotion and I, I gathered that but my lawyer was completely not my Greenpeace lawyer I had a public lawyer and she just said did you do what you did? And I said, yes, because in Greenpeace you always say what you do. Um, and she said, well, you're guilty and um, I can't guarantee getting you out of here because you're under terrorist law and so forth. So it was quite scary. Um, I am a meditator, so I I thought, well, I'm just going to use this as my cave. I had a meditation teacher once who lived in a cave for a year in India and I thought of her and I redesigned my cabin, my, my cabin, my cell as a cave and uh, every time I was given a chance to have a shower, I'd keep a towel and I start to put towels down on the floor, do yoga, tai chi, every exercise I'd ever learned and I meditated an awful lot and um, I wasn't allowed to see anyone. There was nothing to read because the only thing they had in English was the Bible, which they finally found about day five. I decided that I'd never read it, so I'd go ahead with it. But um, the jailer started to come to me. One guy came up one night and he said, you like tea, don't you? And I said, yes. He said, you like milk in it, don't you? Because they're only allowed to have milk once a day. And I said, yes. And he he said, I'll go and make you a cup of tea and put some milk in it for you. I said, oh, thank you so much. You left the door open. And I said, you've left the door open. He said, I'm not worried about you. So there was this kind of lovely thing that happened. Um, uh, the, um, uh, it, the, at the end of the time, the um, head jailer came down to tell me that it was time to go. And uh, I was so in my meditation mode at this time that I actually, as people walked in, I just kind of bowed to them like this because I was just there. And he 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 took his he he, he stood at the door and he, he <laughs> and he he said, I'm so sorry we have kept you here for so long. Um and 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 I could feel that there was this change in the way. So it was this sort of little insight that as I lived the way I wanted that I believed in living 
um, it, it seemed to change things around me, if you understand. It was that kind of experience. So that's externally. You know, we had jailers putting money in. We had the police wishing us luck. We had jailers being kind and wishing the best for us. Um, internally, being in that place of absolute surrender, like I really was totally powerless, and it was this extraordinary sense as a white woman with a STEM background, a doctor, that suddenly none of that counted. None of it. I had zero power. It was, I, I kind of understood something that other people consistently experience their whole life of all rights being taken away. It was a really kind of powerful insight into that, even if it was short term, except at the time, I wasn't quite sure how long it was going to go on for. In fact, was told it would be in, could be indefinite, which was kind of scary. That you know, I was anxious, um, and so there was this sense of how was I going to survive this? How was I going to meet this? And I could feel the terror rising, and I just kept meditating. And as I meditated, the fear didn't go away, but I connected to something beyond it. And I won't say more about that in a public space, except connecting to that that was beyond the fear sustains me in my most challenging moments. And that's what I mean by it being one of the most significant experiences of my life. Mm. 